Hello and welcome back to the Sharks World, ladies and gentlemen. So look, I know I've already done two videos on shark intelligence and I've mentioned the topic in most of my videos. But I came across another article that talks about shark intelligence directly and couldn't resist doing another video about it as it brings some new data to the table and highlights a suspicion I had for a while. Now, as always, despite the fact that I'm going into great detail in this video, I would still highly recommend that you give the main source article a read. It was published just four months ago as of the recording of this video. I will leave a link to it in the description. But before we get into it, be sure to check out my other two videos on shark intelligence. In addition to that, let me extend an invitation to join the Sharks World Discord, as well as some of my other content. Thanks in advance for your time. And with those intros and caveats out of the way, as always, ladies and gentlemen, grab you a Celsius, have a seat at the table, and let's take a look at Shark Intelligence Part 3. So, the beginning of this article highlights things that I have brought up in a number of my videos, one of them being how long sharks and their relatives have been on this planet. Ample time for lots of adaptations and shaping of cognitive abilities. I actually recently did a video on this topic in regards to sharks and adaptive radiation. Despite this, the article confirms something that I've had a suspicion of for a while, and it's that scientists are only now scratching the surface in regards to shark intelligence as well as their cognitive abilities. Glad to know it wasn't me just losing my mind when I couldn't find that many articles in regards to shark intelligence. The reasoning is because there just haven't been that many articles about it. And when I say articles, I mean peer-reviewed scientific papers written by the researchers. This graph here shows just how we're now starting to look closer at shark cognition over the years. The tests highlighted in this article were done on a handful of species over the past decade, ranging from Port Jackson sharks to stingrays to bamboo sharks, which are going to come up a lot in this video. But shark toes? How come they didn't do any tests on species like the great white, mako, or hammerhead? I don't think some of you appreciate just how much of a unit adults of those species are. They note in the article that conducting tests on sharks in general has its own set of challenges. Handling, maintenance, environmental conditions, and so on. This even applies to sharks on the upper ends like nurse sharks, which do not let their docile nature fool you. Nurse sharks are built like tanks, yet alone a stressed one to two ton sack of muscle thrashing about for the sake of a test. That's the main reason scientists use smaller sharks to start with for stuff like this. The research they did falls into the following parts. Auditory stimuli, visual stimuli, numerosity, electrical and magnetic cues, chemical cues, social cognition, spatial learning, time place learning, and cognition in the Anthropocene. Hmm. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna break this up into three videos. I'm going to do the first three categories in this video. Next week, I'm gonna cover the next three, and then the week after that, I'm gonna cover the final three. Sound good? Great. So let's start with the first category, auditory stimuli. We all know that sound travels much faster and further in water and likely plays an important role in any aquatic animal's life. However, one thing they note in this article is the interference of human activities. You see, sound discrimination has been very well studied in birds and humans, but apparently much less so in sharks and rays. This makes sense given the challenges of studying sharks I mentioned earlier, but that doesn't mean data hasn't been gathered from observation. Fishermen and cage divers have noted and believe that sharks over time have learned to recognize the sound of certain boats, 
especially the ones that make a habit out of feeding them or attracting a lot of the fish that they eat. This is supported by a test done pairing a food reward with an artificial sound. In this case, jazz music. The best kind of music, fight me. They used eight juvenile Port Jackson sharks and wanted to see if they would swim to a particular spot in a pool where jazz music was playing. If they did so, they would be rewarded with food. Five out of the eight sharks learned this task. However, when they asked the sharks to discriminate between jazz and blues, yes, they literally jumped in with the microphone and physically asked the sharks, that, that, that's a joke by the way, none of them could do so. Probably because they just wanted to listen to the music. Not really, but maybe. The scientists did note, however, that sharks are capable of differentiating between different sounds. This doesn't surprise me in the least. For those who don't know, contrary to popular belief, a shark's most acute sense is actually its hearing, not smell. This is not to say that their sense of smell isn't an absolute cheat code, but for open water species especially, hearing is vastly underrated by the public when it comes to sharks. But it's not a matter of sharks just using one sense over another. They use all of their senses as one, with some overriding others depending on the context. In another test, gray bamboo sharks, I told you they would come up, could tell the difference between two low frequency sounds. In addition to that, during a go slash no go procedure, they determined that even though both acoustic and visual cues were perceived and memorized by the sharks, visual cues appeared to be the more dominant stimuli, at least in this context. Speaking of which, let's move on to the visual stimuli findings. While auditory stimuli hasn't been that well researched in Elasma bronchi, visual stimuli has been studied extensively. The test for this category once again used bamboo sharks, where they conducted a surreal reversal experiment using two-dimensional geometric objects in a visual two-alternative force choice task. The sharks conducted the experiment in half the session times as they took stingrays that performed the same test. I suppose I should elaborate more on this. When scientists set up certain tests for animals to perform, there are set rules or steps the animal must do in order to receive a reward, which is usually food. Scientists then count how many sessions it takes for the animal to perform the task. The fewer sessions the animal completes the task in, the higher their cognitive flexibility is implied to be, at least in terms of visual stimuli in this case. That's the simple way of putting it. There are a lot more variables that go into this type of stuff, but that's a base level understanding of the conditions. Other experiments have shown sharks are able to discriminate stimulus presence and absence, overall stimulus contrast, different forms, horizontal from vertical orientation. Depending on the species, they can even tell different colors that vary in brightness. Now I want to pause here for a moment and highlight someone I follow in regards to sharks and this topic. Christina Zinato is a shark diver that I have kept my eye on for some time now. Not just because of the amazing things she has done with sharks and her relationship with them, but also because, having spent so much time with them, she is very knowledgeable and empirical about them. In one of her recent posts, she highlighted something that I completely agree with when it comes to sharks and color vision. Most of the public thinks that sharks are colorblind, but the reality is only some sharks are colorblind. The reasoning for this is a similar reason I brought up in my mammal brains versus shark brains video. Just as brains will develop differently based on what an animal is doing, so too will their vision. Some sharks have poor vision because they never see the sunlight. Some sharks have excellent vision because they are active hunters in the open sea. Some sharks can only see certain colors because they only needed to see those particular colors for their survival. 
when it comes to how evolution works, an animal's anatomy is their weapon, and it developed that way for a reason, at least when it comes to animals that have survived for millions upon millions of years, like sharks. I would highly recommend that you go give Miss Christina a follow on Instagram, as well as some of her other content. I will leave a link to her post and her Instagram in the description. Shout out to Miss Christina Zanato. Moving on in the visual category, the scientists also found that the bamboo sharks were able to differentiate between different animals based on movement. The animals whose movement they tested them with included an eel, a trout, a dolphin, and surprisingly, an eagle and a bat. No clue how they could apparently tell the difference between two animals that live in a completely different environment. But, I mean, here we are. This makes sense that sharks would be able to have such a good sense of vision because identifying things in the ocean based on movement is very key because the ocean is almost never a static place. Now, to be clear, I don't think the bamboo sharks actually knew what an eagle and a bat were, just that they could tell that they were different animals based on their movement. Now finally, let's move on to numerosity. For those who don't know, testing numerosity in animals is testing to see if an animal is able to differentiate quantities. Why this is important to animals depends on the context, whether it's for avoiding predators, schooling, looking for a mate, and so on. The two main parameters to be concerned with here are continuous variables and discrete variables. Now, keep in mind, these two strategies are not mutually exclusive. Some animals might pick one over the other depending on what it aids to do. During the test, they once again used Port Jackson sharks, stingrays, and yes, bamboo sharks. While the animals were able to use numerical information independently, math wasn't their strongest subject. Yes, you heard me correctly, sharks and stingrays, to an extent, can do math. Now to be fair, this is very basic math, only sticking to addition and subtraction. For both sharks and rays, only about half the animals were able to perform the problems that they presented to them. How did they set this experiment up for them to do math? Go read the article like I always say in the beginning of my videos. Now, it makes sense that they weren't able to do math that well, because sharks and rays never really needed to do math throughout evolution. Sure, they could get rough estimates of surrounding species and environmental obstacles, but it probably never needed to go any further than that. And this is where we're going to end this video in the shark intelligence series. Expect the next one to be out soon, as I'm eager to continue covering this topic. Please, let me know your thoughts and what you found interesting about this article. And like, go actually read it? There's a lot of small details I didn't cover here that add a lot more sizzle to the steak. But for now, thank you for once again giving me some of your time, and I will see you in the next video. Until then.